The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and I'm so excited to be with you here this morning and this week. It's a very big week. I will tell you right off the bat that we're going to be with you less live this week because we've got some things that we need to go do this week that are amazing and fun. Uh, we'll be filming at those events and then we'll be able to share that with you as soon as we can possibly get that edited. But we're going to be with you live for the next two hours and we are going to be with you live tomorrow for the first hour of Ask Dr. Doreen. So it's a three hour week. That's the only programming that we have live for you this week, but they're gonna be three amazing hours. How's that for a nice deal for you? Thrilled to be here with you. We are coming to you live from the Warner Center in Woodland Hills, California. We are in Tower One of the Warner Center. This is the new home for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and it's the new home for Autism Live. If you're just tuning in and you've seen the show before, you think, oh, is this the new set? This is not the new set. These are temporary digs. We're going to have some pictures for you because we think we're within a week of our new studio being finished on the 18th floor. So we've taken up residence in the 19th floor conference room here. It's a makeshift. We're calling it autism light. Uh, but we're, we, we didn't want to be off the air while the new studio is being built. We can't wait though to be in our permanent home on the 18th floor and uh, check it out. Maybe out later on Facebook, we'll have an, an updated picture. There are actual walls up in the studio. There's drywall up. It's very exciting. And, it, and it's sounding very quiet in there, which was the main thing. Uh, but we are thrilled to be here with you live for the next two hours talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective. Whatever it is that you're experiencing, wherever you are in this beautiful spectrum, this community of people who are either on the spectrum or love other people who are on the spectrum, this includes parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, teachers, practitioners, OTs, speech and language therapists, and individuals, as I said, who are on the spectrum. We are a big, beautiful community. We welcome you here. We know that there, you have individual needs, that there are things that you want to do, there's progress that you want to see, and we want to help you in whatever way we can to get to that progress. Whether you need a little inspiration, you need somebody to hold your hands, you say, puede, right? We can do this. We will hold hands together and do this together. We're here for you. We want to connect you to those resources that you're looking for to help you to get to that progress. How's that for a deal? Uh, we are coming to you in lots of different formats and lots of different ways and there's lots of different ways to interact with us because the truth of the matter is the main point of this show is to have that interaction when you interact with us not only do we learn and hopefully you learn but all of the people watching learn something so Kelby is going to cycle through some of the different ways that you can get a hold of us some of the different ways that you can be watching the show and some of the different ways that you can comment while he is going through that, I will remind you that our home page is autism-live.com. When you go there, so many things to do. We hope that you'll participate with us. But most importantly, you can be watching the live show or a recently recorded live show. In fact, you can watch the last 100 episodes that we've done on that page. Just go to the desktop there where they have the computer and click on the triangle on the computer and it will show you some form of our show. To the side of all that are the white boxes that we refer to as the live feature. When you put your cursor in the box, 
box that says your question and you start typing, all you have to do is hit enter. There is no login, there's no username, there's no password, there's no credit card information. We don't know who you are and that's a wonderful thing, um, but it does allow you to converse with me and with the experts and the guests that we have on the show. We hope that you'll participate by doing that. But also on that homepage, if you go up to the top, um, there is a place that says join our email list. If you click on that, you'll get our weekly uh, viewer guide and you'll get our monthly newsletter, which is full of information, behind the scene information. Really great way to participate. It's totally free. We don't give your information to anybody else uh, so that you can be secure in that knowledge and you can participate with us. Uh, we've got some contests that are coming up too that you can only enter by being on the the email list. So please do participate there. And there's also a blog. You can check out the blog. Fun, fun information all the way around. All right. We also like to remind you at the start of the show, I mentioned we have experts. I try to line up our experts to have them here to be able to answer your questions. Uh, and we do want you to participate with our experts. But I do like to remind you at the start of the show that I'm not one of the experts. I'm here and I have a passionate reason for being here because I'm an autism mom. My son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. He is about to be 12. My heart is just like so overwhelmed with joy for this young man and who he is turning into. And I, I know that I just have had the very smallest part in that. We've had the very best of luck and the best of support. We did get incredibly lucky though to get the information that got us to that support. So that's part of the reason why I'm here, not to be an expert, but hopefully to be somebody on the path with you that's holding your hand and reminding you that you can do this, that you can get to the progress, that there are resources, that there are wonderful people out there who want to be able to help us. And if we can connect you with those people to see how far you can go, uh, I think that that's a really good, solid way to spend a day. So that's why I'm here, but not an expert, just somebody who is terribly interested in helping you to get to that progress because I know what a difference it makes. If you're hearing something right now, I, we have a helicopter that is, is, I can see it out the window. Hopefully it's not going to land on top of the building, but it might be making a landing on the building next to us. So that's what you're hearing. We're not under siege, but uh, we are not in a soundproof studio, as I mentioned before. That's next week. Next week we won't be able to see the helicopter, so rare treat. In any case, uh, we like to start every morning with something that we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. Um, I am I'm missing my thing here, uh, but that's okay. Give me one second. iPad shut down. All right. So jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to make sense of what this means in our lives. The experts will use these terms. And that's all well and good. But if we don't know what they mean and what they mean to us, how can they be useful to us? So we try to make friends with the jargon, one little phrase, acronym at a time. So today's jargon is FAPE, F-A-P-E. What on earth is this? I know when you join the autism community and people start rolling out what I call alphabet land and they go, oh, well, you know, you're, you're going to make sure that you're going to get FAPE. Oh, really? Why FAPE? What on earth is that and why is it important to me? Trust me, it's huge, it's important, and it's there for you. So let's take a look at what our actual definition of FAPE is. FAPE stands for free, appropriate, public education. Uh, it is a term frequently referred to in and around IEPs. Uh, now we've done IEP, I, I told you alphabet land. IEP stands for Individualized Education Plan or Program, depending on which state you're in. Okay, so uh, in the United States, we have laws that are in place. Let's actually go to our working definition for FAPE. Uh, so our working definition for FAPE uh, free appropriate pub public education is what your child is legally entitled to in the United States. So we have laws in place because a long time, not even that long ago, um, back in the 70s, as recently as the 70s, if you were an individual who had any kind of a challenge, 
lunge. Uh, it could be that um, you weren't able to walk upstairs or that you were blind or deaf or had autism or you know any one of a thousand other challenges and you needed to go to school. You were not legally entitled to everything that everyone else got. You weren't. If you couldn't comply with what everyone else was doing, you were left out in the cold and parents were left to pay for private schooling uh, and it was the coldest, harshest, uh, served up thing that anyone could imagine because we all know the challenges that we face and if you had to face it alone and couldn't even guarantee that your child got an education, can you imagine how horrible that was? Well, um, the laws were passed and we'll share those terms for another jargon day, but laws were passed and now our kids have, all of our kids here in the United States, have a legal right to a free, appropriate public education. So you go to an IEP meeting and the whole purpose of an IEP meeting is so that the school can give you FAPE. And at some point in the IEP meeting, usually at the end of the meeting, they will say, here is our offer of FAPE. And they will outline what they think an appropriate public education looks like for your child. And usually that's what the arguing is about, is whether or not it is appropriate. Obviously we're not arguing about the free part because everybody knows, or you should know, hopefully you know, that they cannot charge you anything. You pay your taxes and that entitles you to that free public education. But it needs to be appropriate. Appropriate is the big word of the day. When you go to an IEP meeting and you know that we always recommend that you bring a tape recorder, you need to make sure that you are arguing for what is appropriate. That is what the school will be arguing to say, here's what we're offering, you know, we're giving you two hours of speech every week, we're giving you an OT and we think that's what is appropriate for this child. It is to your benefit as a parent to understand what the word appropriate means for your individual child. You will see that because schools have more and more IEPs that they have to do, that frequently, not always, there can be a tendency to work from a, sort of a, a template, shall we say, where there's something that they offer uh, frequently to a lot of different kids, a lot of different kids. It is always on our side that we must argue that this is individualized and it must be appropriate to the individual. We want to be very careful when we're in IEPs to use that language. If we run the tape recorder so that we can make sure that everybody is behaving in a way that's proper and that no mistakes are being made, we also have to be cognizant of that and not make mistakes. It is not the place in an IEP meeting to talk about what is best for your child. It is appropriate to talk about what is appropriate. But if you understand that, you can do so much because what is appropriate for our kids is what is effective, right? So those are the terms that we want to be using. It really separates uh, how seriously they will take you and how far you can get within the courts. If you're caught on tape saying you want what's best for your child, I guarantee you, because we've seen it time and time again, schools will pummel you with, we're, we're not responsible for best. We're not responsible for giving you the gold standard. We're responsible for giving you what's appropriate. They can use it against you or you can use it in your argument to get what is appropriate, which is what is effective. We can be asking them how, why is what you're offering appropriate? Do you have studies to show that it's appropriate? Do you have studies to show that it is going to help my child to get to progress? Because a, an appropriate education is one in which we learn, so it is effective. All right, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about FAPE later on, and uh, I feel like every year that we've done Autism Live, we've, we've added another section to FAPE for you, um, and, and what is appropriate. You know, I really think it's, uh, the first thing is to know 
free appropriate public education. And last year we added the element of in the least restrictive environment. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on today. And today we're going to add the next part of it, which is giving them a floor of opportunity to access the curriculum. This is a great other tool that we can have when we are in an IEP meeting. This is using the language of the laws to make sure that we get that appropriate public education. So stay tuned for that in the second hour. Uh, we always, at the beginning of the show though, like to have a question that we ask you. We call it the question of the day. We will have time later on today to check in on Facebook to see what you guys have to say. So here's the big question. Are you ready? This is not a guilt trip. But what are you doing this summer to get ready for the fall? <gasps> right? Kind of sucks the air out of you. But if we are thinking right now school's about to end, for some of you it may already have ended, so many graduations are happening, but one way or the other we're all about to be out of school. And what we do in these next three months has the ability to either allow us to get further behind, allow us to maintain, or set us up for success in the fall and this isn't just about camps but you know we've been talking about camps we have a great guest who's going to be with us in a few minutes about talking about camps and how to set our kids up for success always um, but we're talking about you know legally what do we need to do to make sure that the classroom is ready what do we need to do to help the teacher to get ready there are so many things that we can be doing this summer that are fun and so many things that we can do that help us to get set up for success in the fall. We want, always want to be thinking ahead, planning ahead, doing what we can. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit later on, but I want to know from you guys, what are you already doing? Because I know you've got great ideas. What are you already doing this summer to get ready for the fall and set yourself up for success? Now, we always have a topic for the week, and our even though our week is short, we have a topic this week, and it's getting ready for the fall. And for me, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's the, the microcosm of everything. I just, before I, I came upstairs to do this show, had an opportunity to watch a short film that Danny Bowman made apparently over the weekend. Danny Bowman, who was on our show just a week and a half ago, a wonderful, talented, brilliant artist uh, from Powerlight Animation Studios, an amazing young woman who's going to be speaking tomorrow at Temple Grandin and Friends. Yes, it's tomorrow, and yes, we're going to be talking about it a lot. Um, but Danny made a film that's very emotional, and uh, I'm going to be talking to her later on today to see if we have the opportunity to show it here on the show. But I really want to encourage you, if you can go to her Facebook page today, Danny Bowman, D-A-N-I Bowman, B-O-W-M-A-N, or go to Powerlight Animation Studios and check it out. It's uh, <sighs> kind of took my breath away for a second uh, because it's about how so many of us are clamoring that our autism advocates and we want what's best for our kids and we're fighting for legislation, we're fighting for this and we're fighting for that. And um, it's a very powerful piece that Danny reminds us there's some other things that are really, really important right now. Uh, so I encourage you to watch it. And, and it really brought home to me, not only do we need to be getting ready for the fall, but we need to be getting ready for adulthood. And we need to be more mindful of our adults and how we set them up for success for the rest of their lives. Uh, and a big part of that is making sure that they have the ability to get jobs. Not just to train them for jobs, but that's an important part of it, but getting them ready for jobs. We've been talking about that a lot. We're going to continue to talk about it, and we're going to talk about Temple Grandin and Friends, but we're going to be very mindful of that the whole reason for this event tomorrow night is for Autism Works Now to help individuals who are on the spectrum to be job ready and to actually get and keep jobs. It's important. So that's another fall that we need to get ready for. Uh, okay, so some of the things we're going to be talking about today on the show, we've got a bunch of questions that you guys have sent in. We've got a bunch of autism news, some good, uh, others not so good. And I mentioned we have another camp guest who's going to be with us. Mike Fogel is going to be joining us in just a few minutes from Camp Pegasus. You're going to love hearing all about this spectacular camp. 
It's another one of the Baker Grant Summer Camp recipients from Autism Speaks. Uh, I want to encourage you to go to autismspeaks.org, check out their Baker Summer Camp grant recipients. These are camps that put in for grant funds and, and won those grant funds based on how wonderful their programs were, how timely they were, how useful they were. They're all over the United States. Each camp was given a grant and the grant wasn't to just build their program, it was so that they would have scholarships available to give to individuals who are on the spectrum who might otherwise not be able to afford to go to camp. So it's a win-win, camps that have already been vetted as being really useful and helpful for our individuals on the spectrum. And by the way, not all just kids we're talking about for adults as well and they have money towards scholarships so you want to snatch those up before they're all gone check it out at autismspeaks.org again it's baker camp grant recipients but mike fogel is going to be with us in just a few minutes to talk about camp pegasus another one of those grant recipients stick with us swing on this wonderful day, this wonderful walk with Mr. Matt Asner. Talk to us about today's walk. Do we have any facts, figures, numbers, or just pure emotion? Just pure emotion. I'm about to get the numbers. We'll see what it is. Okay. I think it's probably close to 1-6, probably. That's my feeling. Uh, but it's incredible. We had 55,000 people plus here tonight, today. And, and you know, I, I, you know, honestly, in my, I've been here seven years. It gets better and better and better. So. And and really what you fostered here today is hope. I know that's your favorite four-letter word. Uh, where are we without hope? Where are we? Really, I mean, seriously, where are we without hope? Hope is everything. Hope is eternal. This is a pretty big event. Uh, every year I love it. What does this event mean to you? Well, I just think it's great that you see so many people coming out to support uh, you know, autism. So we're here with Max Burkholder. In your life, there's and a whole community of people that are going to love you no matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter what you do. And that's the autism community. Are you okay with this? Is this a good thing? I'm pretty okay with it. This seems to be a pretty happy, supportive community. Well, did. well what did you learn about autism through portraying this wonderful character? Um, sort of the end of individuality of it you know like with with autism spectrum disorders a, a tendency of, is to sort of generalize uh, everybody with sort of the same degree of affliction as uh, sort of exactly the same and uh, very um, you know very generalize them a lot but um, something I, f I found while well, just talking to everybody and that I tried to put into the characters just the sense of individuality that all of all of them have everybody has um, and so at a certain point it became not really even portraying autism, it just sort of became portraying the character. I, I want to say thank you on behalf of everybody for oh, how, what that's you very do sweet. Uh, to bring awareness and to raise money. That's a, that's a tremendous, tremendous legacy. But as a dad, you've got other things that you're doing as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to know, as a family, if you have any advice, what's been something that's been helpful to you personally? You know, get your autistic kids out in the community. I mean, my son's got a guide dog, so he goes to a lot of cool places. He surfs, he skis, does gymnastics. He's actually trying Hebrew school. I'm not quite sure if he knows what's happening there. Uh, but he does all kinds of cool things, and he has a lot of friends. Um, right now, most of his friends are the adults who take care of him. And uh, over time, hopefully he'll have more friends who are his age, and you'll see him walking around, and people won't be nervous around him. Uh, the dog's been very helpful with that. Um, it's like The dog is like the most infectious thing in the world. Like Everybody wants to be near the dog, and he sees that, and he gets some of that affection onto him. So as a family, you know, we're just there to support Tyler and make him happy.
welcome back to Autism Live. You know, I wanted to, I have a bunch of shout outs that I want to do today for people who are doing a good job and, and doing uh, wonderful work. And one of the shout outs that we want to do is to one of our viewers, DJ, who is doing a good job and sent us a story that we had not otherwise seen. And so, DJ, I want to thank you. We love it when viewers send us stories because, and if you're ever thinking, oh, I wonder if Shannon knows about this. Yes, sometimes I get 20 people sending me one story, but you know what? That's okay because it helps us to all stay in contact. And sometimes one person sends me a story and nobody else sends it to me and it makes all the difference. So feel free to share stories with me, especially when they're local stories that I wouldn't otherwise get to. Um, but DJ shared a story with us that's being featured right now on The Mighty, which is another place place that I'd like to give a big shout out to. We've had folks from the Mighty on the show before. It's a wonderful site. And you know how sometimes you just need to pick me up, you need a shot in the arm, you need to know it's all going to be okay and there are good people and that you're not always aware that there's good people, you know, because the, the people who are in the not good space, will, they'll wave to you. <laughs> they'll let you know that they're there. But sometimes the people who are trying so hard to help us are busy helping us and don't go, hi, here I am, here I am, thinking about you and thinking wonderful things about you. And the Mighty reveals those people to us on a regular basis. So definitely check out the Mighty. You will get, and it's, it's certainly about everything under the sun, not just about autism. And I love that about it too, because I need to be reminded from day to day that, you know, autism is not the only challenge that anybody is facing, right? And the Mighty shows us how when people have challenges and rise above them that it's probably the most beautiful thing on the face of the earth. So check out The Mighty and uh, there's a specific story that's on The Mighty right now that the title of it is When a Cashier at the Grocery Store Brought Me to Tears with Eight Words. And uh, this touched my heart in a special way because, and I want you to read the story because it's an amazing mom and I want to get her name right here because uh, I do have it here somewhere in my list of things. Tyann Sheldon Rao uh, wrote this for The Mighty. And um, it, it, I don't know how recently this happened, but it's a story about her son and a very special grocery store where he has spent many experiences. Some of them great and, you know, some of them very mundane as we all do in a grocery store and some of them probably difficult for mom. But this particular grocery store has a special place in my heart. It's called High V. And for those of you who are in the Midwest, particularly in the Iowa area, you're very familiar with High V. And uh, this mom writes about uh, many experiences that she's had in High V, but th them culminating with one very special moment with a person working at customer service at High V. So we got to do a big shout out to the folks at High V first of all, because uh, lovely, lovely thing. And I'm sure that the person who said the the magic eight words to this mom. I don't think I should tell you what the eight words are because I think you should take a look at Mighty and see what they are. Um, but she said eight words that probably didn't mean a whole lot to her but meant everything under the sun to this mom that made this mom feel like she belonged, that she was seen, that her child, I'm, I'm getting emotional, that her child was seen and that she was a part of something bigger than what she realized. It's one of those amazing moments when you pull back the veil and see that while you were going through a hard time, there were people there who cared. There were people there who saw you. It's truly a lovely thing. You got to check it out on the Mighty. Um, but I, I, it made me think about too. I have been in Hy-Vee grocery stores a lot, uh, and especially a couple of years ago. Wet, right, my my family, most of my family lives in Iowa. I'm not from Iowa, so I don't, I don't, I don't entirely understand that. But <laughs> But they do. And it's where my parents were born and raised. And uh, it's where my siblings now live. And when my mom was sick, uh, and my son and I went on four different occasions, both to you know be there when she was sick, to be there when she died, and then to be there afterwards, uh, we spent a lot of time at Hy-Vee. And uh, in, the, in the five years previous to that, you know, of course, my mom lived close to and went to Hy-Vee all the time and would talk to the folks at Hy-Vee and would say to them, hey, you know, I've got this nephew who's on the autism spectrum and he, you know, needs certain GFCF things. And uh, it was through Hy-Vee that m my mom uh, connected us with uh, Breads from Anna. 
which is made in Iowa and is carried in hy vee stores and should be carried in every store. If you haven't tried breads from Anna, I'm telling you, it's a spiritual experience. Uh, they don't have sugar. They have honey in them, um, and they're GFCF. They're amazing. You've got to get the banana bread and the pumpkin bread. Shout out for breads from Anna. And shout out for hy vee because the way they worked with my mom to bring in, you would think, I live in Los Angeles where, you know, we have access to everything under the sun here, and, you know, we have some pretty impressive grocery stores that, you know, we can go to the store and there's dragon fruit on, on the shelf in December, and it's pretty impressive. But going to a high V store and checking out their gluten-free section puts Los Angeles to shame. Sorry, it just does. Um, and they're willing to order things, and they were great to my mom about finding any little thing that she needed and bringing it into the store. So you got to love hy V. And here's another story of somebody at, at a hy V store making a difference for a family. This is a beautifully written piece uh, that made me very emotional this morning. Again, the author is, and I'm all teary-eyed, Tyann Sheldon Rao. It's on the Mighty. Check it out. So thumbs up to Michelle. Uh, Tyann, excuse me. I don't know where I came up with Michelle. Uh, that might have been the name of the woman in the Hy-Vee store. Thumbs up to Hy-Vee, thumbs up to the Mighty. Check it out. If you need that little bit of inspiration, I guarantee you, you'll get it from this story. And thanks to GJ for hooking us up with this particular story. We're going to take a break. I'm going to mop down, and we're going to be back with more Autism Live and some of your questions after these messages. Another parent wants to know, how do I find out that one thing that my kid is really good at? Now, when they get older, they're going to kind of divide into two groups. You're going to have the kids that become verbal, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have the kids that are nonverbal, got many more problems. Maybe they still have epilepsy or some other problem. And they kind of need different services. And the ones that get verbal, they, what we need to be doing with them is develop the area of strength. And that area of strength often will show up around third or fourth grade, sometimes earlier. But my ability in art showed up when I was in third and fourth grade, and it was always encouraged. And I was encouraged to do lots of different kinds of art. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would have just been endless horse heads. Mm -hmm. You know, mother would say to me, why don't you draw a picture of a beach <laughs> or, or something else? Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, you, you want to broaden it out. If the kid's fixated on trains, let's teach reading with trains, math with trains. Tap into that fixation, mm -hmm. but develop the area of strength. Some kids it's going to be art. Other kids it's going to be mathematics. So you got a third grader who's smart in math, and he wants a sixth grade math book. Give him the sixth grade math book. Don't bore him with the baby stuff. But that kid's going to have trouble with reading because the common thing is the uneven skills. And then you have the kids that are the history buffs, and these kids are often really good at writing skills. You tend to have uneven skills, but tap into their fixations and use those to motivate, but broaden. If he likes trains just watching them, well, we're going to take that interest in trains to do some math with it. Or maybe read about the history of the railroad. You know, tap into that motivation. One of the things I really want to talk about is we've got to stretch these kids. I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about physically stretching them, mentally stretching them. Stretching them to do new things. I'm seeing too many kids that haven't learned how to shop, how to order food at McDonald's. So you start out, let's say it's ordering food at McDonald's or at Burger King. So you take them up there and they watch you order it. And then eventually you go in when the store's not busy and they have to go up and order it while you're sitting at the table watching and then you coach them. And then eventually they can go in the restaurant themselves. I can remember I was scared to go to the lumber yard alone and buy lumber. My mother made me go and she knew I could do it. I had done, bought lumber with her many times. But there's a tendency to want to have somebody else there when they do it and they've got to learn how to do things alone. And you gradually have got to kind of push it. You've got to stretch them. And I'm seeing too many kids not learning basic skills. I saw a 19-year-old honor student that actually knows how to drive that had never shopped in the grocery store all by herself. That is just ridiculous. You know, you've got to stretch them. You push too hard, they're going to be panic. And, and, and the other thing is no surprises. No surprises. I knew all about the ranch long before I went there. I talked to Ann. But if you don't stretch these kids, they don't grow. 
Welcome back to Autism Live. We have other stories that we wanted to cover for you. We are having that interview with Mike Bogle. I misspoke uh, because it's not until uh, 40 after the hour. Um, but wanted to talk with you uh, a little bit about the law that is up for passage here in the United or not in the United States in California. Um, I see I got all emotional and uh, it's going to take me forever to come back. I know you guys appreciate that uh, I just am a hormone on a leash. <laughs> but whatever. In any case, uh, Bill SB277, uh, which is the vaccination bill that was proposed by State Senator, California State Senator, Dr. Richard Pan. He is a pediatrician here in California and after the measles outbreak that happened at Disneyland took it upon himself and uh, with a couple of other state senators decided that there should be new legislation here in California. California to date has been one of the most lenient states on um, vaccination before school. You had the ability to uh, opt out of getting your child vaccinated. It wasn't a very well-known fact, but you could get your child vaccinated uh, out of vaccinations by having a medical excuse for a doctor saying that your child's immune system was not capable of handling the vaccines. For children who have leukemia, I mean, we certainly have heard this all over the news during the measles. There were many parents who were coming forward and saying, look, my child doesn't have a choice. Medically, they cannot get this vaccine. And so we're counting on the rest of you who can to do that. But there were two other exemptions that you could do in the state of California. You could exempt yourself on religious beliefs. If there was, uh, you know, there are certainly several different religions that don't believe in putting things into your body um, and don't believe in medical treatment. Um, and so you could exempt yourself for religious reasons. And then there was a third exemption in, in California, which is only true in a few other states as well, that was the personal beliefs exemption. That you, you didn't have to say, my doctor says that I can't. You did not have to say it's a religion that I belong to. You could say, because of personal beliefs, I am choosing not to vaccinate my child. So those were the three ways. Now, I will say that um, as a parent in the state of California, no one put that on a billboard that was not particularly well known among parents and the hoops that one would have to go through in order to do any of those exemptions were lengthy. There have been many blogs written about this, about parents going in uh, to sign their kids up for kindergarten and being told you must come back with this vaccine card and it must be filled out and you must be up to date or your child will not be allowed in school the first day. I personally have sat at many uh, kindergarten roundups where they, you know, stand in front of the entire and they say there are no exemptions. Everyone has to have their vaccines and no one will be allowed to go to school. Um, and parents have reported that when they have gone and said, no, I, I, can I get the exemption form so I can fill it out and give it back to you, that they were told there are no exemptions. Uh, you know, there's, there's no way that you can be exempt, that there's none, there are no exemptions whatsoever, and that only after quoting the law was the parent given the exemption form. So I just want to say that, you know, I, I don't in any way think that this was easy for someone to opt out of vaccines. There were many things that they had to do. Then the law changed a couple of years ago that you couldn't just fill out and say, um, if, if it was a medical exemption, you had to get the doctor to sign it. And if you had um, uh, an exemption that was for personal beliefs or religious, we have uh, incoming call, Kelby, in my ear. Uh, <laughs> my phone is ringing in my ear. Um, but if you uh, w uh, wanted one of the other two exemptions in the state of California for the last, it's over a year, you had to go to a doctor, at least have a conference with them, and sign off saying that you understood what the issues were in, you know, your declining the vaccine. So it has never been easy for anyone to exempt themselves from a vaccine. But now the bill, the, this new bill is proposing that both the religious exemption and the personal belief exemption go away. The bill has gone through several different rewrites, but as of last Thursday, it did pass the state Senate with an overwhelming margin of 25 to 10, I believe it is, and now it will move to the state assembly. If it passes the state assembly, which could be as early as this week, then it will go to the governor's 
desk for Governor Jerry Brown to sign or veto. We have seen in the past that sometimes that takes, you know, a month or more for the governor to make a decision. Um, but the the recent changes in the bill um, that are should be noted are that um, they and it isn't even a part of the language yet, but it has been promised to the assembly that this language would be added before it comes to them, which would uh, put a grandfather clause so that children who have already started school, if your child is uh, older than kindergarten but younger than seventh grade, that they won't be uh, pursuing it with those children. It'll only be children that are new coming into kindergarten and children that are getting ready to start seventh grade. That before you start those two school areas, they will be asking for you to make sure that you're vaccinated or you will not be allowed to come. Um, and the other uh, difference that they are, that has a proposal that has already been written in is that you can homeschool your child with multiple families together. In the original bill, you could not do that. They could, uh, they, you could only be related if you were homeschooling, but the new bill says no, you can homeschool groups of children together and that uh, you can do independent study with the school. Very interesting. I will tell you that Forbes this week is uh, just yesterday, an article came out in Forbes, and the title of it is California Vaccination Bill SB 277 Clears Senate and Will Save Taxpayer Money If It Becomes Law. Uh, it's a very interesting article. It does not take into consideration that a lot of the children who uh, will be seeking um, to, that have in the past, seeked to um, be exempt are individuals who have IEPs. And if those individuals with IEPs are forced to not go to school, the schools will be responsible for making sure that those children are appropriately educated at home. I don't see how that saves taxpayers money, but we'll keep our eyes peeled on this. It is time though for us to take a break because we're gonna be joined by a very special guest from Camp Pegasus, so stick with us. Say howdy, we say hi. Let's get wild, let's get wild, let's get, let's get, 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 let's get wild. Hey, welcome back to Autism Live. We heard you. Everybody wants macaroni and cheese. Yeah, but we're gonna make it allergy free. But here's what's the crazy part of this macaroni and cheese. It's actually healthy. And it tastes good. Yeah, it tastes really good. <laughs> That's the most important part. <laughs> so we're going to start. We got our water boiling. Um, there's so many variations on the pasta. Um, we're using today a corn pasta. We can verify with the manufacturer that we have a GMO-free product. So let's go ahead and put that in there. Ooh, yeah. And if you don't mind, stir that sure. up for me, my friend. Now it's sticking a little bit to the bottom. Yeah. Is that okay? We maybe add a little more high heat oil okay. and Spread that around again. One thing you gotta know about gluten-free pasta, if you overcook this, it becomes mush. Let's move this guy over to the Stop other it. burner so you can see what I'm doing. And now we're gonna start with the old macaroni and cheese sauce. What's great is there's a lot for, um, you know, different soups. And the way that I look at soups, and again, please follow the recipe on uh, your screen right now. I don't like to measure very often. Uh, but what I like to use is a creamy um, butternut squash soup. So this soup is great because it adds a lot of flavor um, to the dish, but also gives people another serving of vegetables. With kids, we don't want to over season. Maybe with the adults, we can uh, season some for the kids first, pull it out, serve them, and then add a little more you know, garlic powder or onion powder or other types of things into your dish. So the next most important thing on this recipe is we're gonna add in a thickener and the faux cheese. Now some people like their sauce really thick, so you just add in more cornstarch or more arrowroot, so that's not a big deal. How's that doing? You think I, think it's ready? I think it's done. Okay, so why don't we switch? I'll okay. take that, you do that. Okay. And um, I'm going to strain this bad boy here. Here, let me turn that off. Okay. Or we're going to cause trouble again. <laughs> trouble oh. in Lisa's kitchen. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's another show. Don't. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and get this all strained. It's a good consistency. So I'm going to check to make sure our pasta is cooked. So really, you just want to make sure, just like any pasta, 
It's a little bit squeezy, a little bit. Nice. Dude, good job. Yay. We're good. It looks yummy. So even though the cheese is not totally melted, it's okay, don't panic. What's important is that you're gonna love this recipe once you eat it. Um, what I enjoy most about this recipe is that it's, it smells good, but this That's stuff perfect. is amazing. So if you don't mind, I'm going to serve you some up and you can maybe blow a little bit on it so you don't burn your mouth. Sorry, I'm once a mom, always a mom. I was like, mom. just like, wait till I can. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, but I can't wait. wait. I'm excited. <laughs> So I'm gonna give a shot of this too, but. Oh my gosh, that is so good. This is the ultimate comfort food. So oh, it's so uh, good. Isn't it good. And I'm not just saying that, it is really <laughs> good. Mmm. It literally tastes like something our kids would really like. And that sweetness is really, really, really good. So the bonus for us is that when we're serving this to our kids, they're actually getting a full serving of vegetables in this. So instead of just eating a bunch of carbs and worthless calories, you're actually getting some good stuff in this. And um, we'll be back next time. I hope you join us again here on Autism Live. We're really loving the feedback. And if you have additional feedback, here's how you get it to us. You can send it to us via email at autismlive at gmail.com. On Facebook, Facebook, mm -hmm. facebook.com slash autism live. And also there's thousands of recipes waiting for you to discover them with pictures and different things on the Taka website. So you can hit Taka on the web, takanow.org, and we'll be back. Hopefully we'll get to do this again. I had so much Maybe fun. Maybe we'll have a little wine, but you gotta join <laughs> us next time. We'll look forward to seeing you then. Bye guys, we're gonna keep eating. <laughs> you say hi, we say hi. Let's get right, let's get right. Let's get, let's get, let's get. Welcome back to Autism Live. So excited right now. As you know, we've been featuring camps. We're talking about how can we take these summer months and get the most out of them to set ourselves up for success? We've been talking to different camps that are recipients of the Autism Speaks Baker Camp Grant. These are amazing grants. I've mentioned to you before on the show that I've sat on this committee, not this year, but in the past, um, that helps decide which camps should receive these wonderful grants. Um, and Truly, they've done an amazing job this summer of picking camps all over the United States that are really super fabulous for our kids on the autism spectrum. And the wonderful thing about the grants is that it allows the camp to give scholarships to individuals who might otherwise not be able to afford to go to camp and have that camp experience. So our next camp that we're featuring today is Camp Pegasus. This is an amazing camp and joining us from Camp Pegasus is Mike Vogel. He is the founder and director of the camp and he's going to be telling us about their very unique program. But Mike, first of all, thank you for being with us here at Autism Live. Thanks for having me. And uh, your camp is located in Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia, is that correct? That's right. And tell us a little bit about Camp Pegasus. Okay, happy to. We are a therapeutic social skills camp. Uh, I've been a social skills therapist. I'm a licensed professional counselor and an art therapist. And I developed a social skills therapy program 15 years ago. It's just grown and grown, it's been well received. And then we spun Camp Pegasus off out of that program. And uh, this is the third year of Camp Pegasus, after about 15 years of doing social skills therapy at the Art of Friendship Social Skills Program. And what kids get at our camp is, uh, in addition to a very structured day that helps to be successful, they get a very special social skills training approach in which uh, there's direct instruction in social skills every day. And then the kids go through our super fun and structured uh, camp schedule practicing these skills with peers from every different angle, whether it's art-based or music-based activities, which are art therapy and music therapy, social skills groups. We also have improv comedy, circus arts. We have an outdoor sports period, computer play, and indoor free play. So with all these, from all these different angles, the kids are learning and practicing. And then in our style of camp, it's not just you know, a fun day, which it definitely is, but also our staff are very active in employing a very positive social skills training approach. And so we look to catch and praise every positive skill that the kids are employing that helps the day go well. And we're looking to elicit more and more positive replacement social skills, whether they're ones that we teach 
or whether it's ones that uh, they, the kids, our campers produce by themselves. And so we're framing them because our population, you know, kids on the spectrum tend to not realize when it is that, that, that they do a positive social skill. So we're framing and validating and reinforcing those positives. And then our staff are also there to sort of catch and support some of the weaker moments where um, there might be moments of inflexibility or a conflict between two campers or, um, or a meltdown. And so we have a very compassionate um, sort of de-escalation procedure and approach so that kids only feel successful with us and uh, we can handle just about anything that comes up with a child. Yeah, it's, it's really amazing when we're talking about social skills, the difference of, of when you're there to catch it in the moment. Sometimes it's like lightning in a jar. You know, our, our kids are, in, are involved in social moments all day long, and they can keep making the same mistake over and over and over again. And if we don't catch it in that moment and help them to reframe it, it's, it's a loss. And so I, I love the idea that your camp is so on this. Tell us, if, if somebody's watching and they're in the Philadelphia area, Mike, where do they need to go to find out more about your camp and to get registered? Sure. Uh, you can go to camppegasus.com. And our website is very thorough. It describes the whole program in depth, sort of the way that I described it. There's also uh, some additional information about pricing sessions. Kids can come for two weeks, a minimum of two weeks, up through all eight. It's an eight-week day camp. And, um, and what ages is it again, Mike? And it's 6 through 15. And we welcome parents' uh, calls with questions about it because we want parents to feel very comfortable with the program and our enrollment process. We do an important screening prior to kids enrolling in the camp because we really want to make sure that our camp is going to properly support a child and be able to address their challenges. So I read a child's uh, either neuropsych reports or an IEP from a school district. And that helps us to make sure that we're accepting kids who are all really going to be able to work together and to benefit from our program. Wonderful. And, and you, you, it, we should note that you don't just have summer programs. You have year-round programs, correct? That's right. That's uh, right. All year round. We have after-school and weekend social skills therapy programs at our program, which is called The Art of Friendship. Really and, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Remarkable. Thanks. Well, I kind of want to take a break, uh, Mike, and then come back and talk because so many families are, have concerns about social skills. We know that for all of our kids on the autism spectrum, this yeah. is an area of weakness that needs to be addressed, social skills. So uh, I want to come back and talk a little bit about what are the hallmarks of a good social skills program. So if somebody isn't in the Phil Philadelphia area, doesn't have the ability to take advantage of what you've got, that maybe you can help us to know what they should look for at the camps and programs that they're looking at. Would you be willing to mm -hmm. do that for us? Sure. Okay. Love to. We're going to take a short break and then we're going to be back more with Mike Fogel after these messages. What do you think about ABA treatment? ABA is the one that's documented, but I think that's what I think is important with little kids, the intensity. If this kid's two, three, and four years old, he needs 20 or 30 hours a week of intensive early intervention, working one-to-one -one with an effective teacher. Mm -hmm. And an effective teacher knows kind of how just hard to push, because you've got to stretch these kids. Mm -hmm. If you don't stretch them somewhere, they don't advance. Mm -hmm. You push them on them too hard, they go into sensory shutdown. The worst thing you could do with an autistic two-year-old is to do nothing with them and just let them sit there rocking. And when I was very young, at two and a half, ABA type things were used on me, but it wasn't called ABA in that day. Right. You know, my teacher would hold up a cup and she'd speak slowly. You gotta speak slowly to these kids because there's auditory processing problems. So you say cup, and then I'd say cup, and, and the teacher would praise me. You know, that's very similar to ABA. You know, ABA in its um, you know, original form is a little kids program. The whole idea is you're trying to get language jump started. And I like the more flexible kinds of ABA. You've got different levels of kids. Mm -hmm. um, once, I mean, I had ABA type stuff when I was young, but mm -hmm. then after I pulled out of it, I didn't have to go through elaborate things of getting ready for school. I still have this habit now today. I lay my clothes out the night before that I'm going to wear, mm -hmm. so when I'm sleepy, I can just get them on. And then you have other individuals where they've got to do very structured, you know, uh, you know, breaking down the task analysis. This is where after you get out of the little kids and you get them talking, they kind of diverge into yeah. 
different levels of functioning. And a type of ABA program that'd be suitable for a very severe kid would not be something you'd want to do with a mild Asperger kid because you're going to bore them to death and make them hate school. Absolutely. Welcome back to Autism Live. We have with us via Skype right now Mike Fogel, who is the founder and director of Camp Pegasus. Uh, amazing place. We've been talking with him. It's just outside of Philadelphia. They've got a fabulous camp this summer that we want to encourage people to check out. They got a Baker Camp grant from Autism Speaks, so we, we know that they're doing great work. They really specialize in social skills. So we've asked Mike to stick around with us and talk with us about what are some hallmarks of a really good social skills program. Because we all know we want a social skills program, but when we're out shopping, I for one as an autism parent, I don't know what to necessarily look for. What's your opinion on this, Mike? Um, in the creation of our program, I sort of shopped around and I did a lot of research trying to pull a bunch of best practice uh, strategies and, and weave them into our program. And so some of the things that you want to look for is one, there always should be direct instruction in social skills, social thinking, um, uh, reading social cues, and as well, this is sort of like underreported, but there's also a need for cognitive behavioral coping skills as well, because there's so much anxiety that often goes along with spectrum disorders that can also either increase um, avoidance symptoms and make it more difficult to engage really well. So, uh, so I would look for a program that has both of those, so the social skills and the emotional coping skills. Mike, I'm so excited to hear you say that because I think that that is something that gets left out of a lot of programs. And we see for our kids, a lot of times as their, their social skills improve, the rise in anxiety comes and, and it takes people by surprise sometimes. But the mm -hmm. idea of putting those two things together to be working on that as, as you're working on the social skills is absolutely, I think, brilliant. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, you also want the program to be to be developmentally appropriate. So, you know, kids who are four, five, and six need something very different than teenagers, where it's a lot should be a lot more focused on handling unstructured situations, uh, hanging out skills, and conversation skills, and sort of pre-life skills. So, uh, it can be activity-based for younger kids, and then a lot more conversation-based for older kids. You want to think about that. Um, I, I, Optional, depending on the program, you could also look for, is there a reward system? Is there some kind of behavior mod system that helps to support behavior and also reinforce the, uh, the adoption of new uh, positive social skills? And another very, very important piece is, does the social skills program uh, collaborate with parents and with schools? The very best social skills programs really occur across the home and school day. And Kate, does it only show up in an office once a week for an hour? Really have a hard time generalizing the skills from the office to the rest of their lives. But if you can, uh, if the therapist works with parents, teaches parents the social skill lessons and language, and or co either personally collaborates with the school or, uh, or provides the information uh, and hard copies to schools, then schools and everyone in the child's life can be using the same social skills language. Language, And when you really sort of cast a net around a child's whole world and immerse them in the language, it's so much easier for them to repeat and repeat these skills until they become new positive social habits. Love the idea of that. We can see why you're an expert in this field, Mike. Uh, <laughs> you get it. Thanks. I think that's remarkable. Uh, yeah. Any other tips for us? of what we're looking for in a social skills program, because that's pretty comprehensive. Yes. Uh, there's one other huge piece, which is that it's got to be fun. Um, we're teaching social skills to basically a group of people where it's almost like they have a social learning disability. So they're working hard all day long, and in social skills groups, it's work uh, to learn these new skills. And it can be frustrating, and it can be... Uh, anxiety provoking for them. So anytime that you can create an environment that is just fun, that's friendly, and that speaks to the, the need for pleasure in the process, uh, I think you're going to see a lot better uh, engagement and participation from the child and the participants. Parents are going to see a lot less resistance and a lot more 
just excitement to show up at the program. And it's so much easier to learn hard things when it comes in sort of wrapped in a fun package. So you want to sort of assess any social skills program for that. What's the tone? Does it sound like the right fit for my child and my family? Absolutely. Boy, you're, you're, you're singing our song here, Mike. That's uh, great. Because if it's not fun, it doesn't matter what you're teaching and how good it is. If it's not fun, the kids aren't going to do it. And if they don't have a lot of opportunities and consistency, we're not going to get it done. So right. I, I love, love, love these tips. These are great things to look for when we're looking at a social skills program, whether it's a camp or a year-long program. But of course, if you are in the Philadelphia area, uh, Camp Pegasus, you're getting it done and keeping it fun. I love that you're including art in everything because we know that the arts are a great way for our kids to be able mm -hmm. to access things that we couldn't otherwise access. Uh, you're doing a great job. Tell us your camp, um, the, um, I, I can't even speak. The website, I got so excited. Uh, what's your website, Mike? The website is uh, www.camppegasus.com. And it's a beautiful website. I'm on it right now. Well, Thanks. Mike, we think you're doing a great job. I'm, I'm thrilled that Autism Speaks recognized you with a Baker Camp grant. We yeah. think uh, it's going to be a, a great camp, and I'm thrilled that some more kids are going to be able to be able to afford it. Um, so keep up the good work. I hope that at some point... Uh, you'll be able to expand and deal with our older kids and adults. We actually have designs on a program called the Wings Program, which would be a high program. This is maybe two years away in its development, but we're planning uh, sort of like, um, uh, like a social skills, leadership, slash employment uh, type program that would have the, our, our teens functioning in the morning as CITs, like counselors in training, and then in the afternoons, they'd have their own social camp programming. And on Fridays, they would have, um, they would have uh, field trips. Love it. Uh, so that's... And what's the, the name of that program again, Mike? Because you froze for just a second there. What's the name of the program? One day that will be called the Wings Program. The Wings Program. Just a couple years away. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to that. Uh, yeah. But again, you're doing a remarkable job. And thank you so much for being with thank us you. today. Take I care. I really appreciate the time. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Uh, wonderful young man, wonderful program. Uh, if you're in the Philadelphia area, definitely check out Camp Pegasus. Uh, and now it is time for us to go to the A word. This is the ongoing documentary being made by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders following a little boy, Jack Riley, diagnosed with autism at the age of two. This is particularly poignant for us today as we got to spend a great deal of time with Jack Riley and his family yesterday. Take a look at this young man and I'll give you a little bit of an update when we come back after the A word. We skipped a few in the middle, didn't we, love? Jack Riley likes to watch videos about the ABCs, or the ABBCs, as he likes to say. He kept uh, throwing a fit and misbehaving when he wasn't getting what he wanted. We finally decided it was time to uh, turn off the computer. And of course, we did that without warning him. He threw uh, one of the biggest tantrums I've ne ever seen from him because he's used to getting his way now because we're, now that he can say it, we're supposed to reward him. Right. But now he's testing us. While we are 100% ABA advocates and we believe it is working on our son, there is a little fallout in reinforcing these requests um, that he doesn't quite understand now that uh, he doesn't get everything he wants. Bye-bye! This is completely typical. When requesting isn't something that happens naturally with your child, you want to create as many opportunities to practice the skill, so you reinforce each time they request because it will increase the frequency they demand. Once the requests are at a rate you want, then you should begin to fade the frequency of reinforcement and teach new advanced skills such as having the child wait for a desired item or let them know that they must choose something else. These are all life skills. Not every desire will be met, but you are more likely to get what you want if you communicate your wants appropriately. You want some applesauce, buddy? <laughs> yeah, why don't we put 
get the car over here, yeah, but... Just take the car. No, we're just going to take a break. Take, take a break. Take, take a break. Take a break. Bye-bye. Do you want this? Bye-bye. Do you want the car? Do you want more car? Settle down. Settle down. Okay, Settle do you down. want more car? Okay. And you want applesauce? Okay. All right. Take another bite. One more. There you go. Nice. That was a good okay. bite too, buddy. There you go. Good bite. Yeah, I should have warned him before I took it away. We don't, we get reminded all the time. It work, it just works so well. It does. It really does. Yeah. To do it and... Okay, ten more seconds and bye bye car. Okay. Bye bye car. Ten ten okay okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, let me have it. Bye bye car. Oh. No, that's okay. Settle down. Thank you. Take two, two bites, please. Two, do you want the car? Yes. Two okay. bites. Two bites. Good good talking. One. And then good two. Good job. Good job, buddy. Good job. Good job. Good job. How last meal time been going with you? Still the same? Still yeah, it's going well. Yeah. You know what he had last night? Did she sure I'll tell you? No. We are documenting this because this bite of spaghetti that he's about to take is the first ever meal that Jack Riley has had exactly what mommy and daddy are having. With the exception of the cottage cheese, he would eat that too, but we're we're going slow. I realize it's just spaghetti and lots of kids probably eat spaghetti, but our kid never did. Not for us anyway. And now he's like just a regular kid having dinner with mom and dad. Here we go. Hey, go. All right, make it go down. Go down. Whee! Yay! Good job. Should we build more tracks? Yeah, more tracks. Yeah, more tracks. Okay, sure. Here you go. Do you want the green one or the blue one? Green. I. You want which one? Black. You want black? Oh, well, none of the ones I offered you. Cool. I like that. I like it. And he's definitely requesting more eating and drinking, which is really good to hear. So um, I don't know if they want to introduce him to other things. Like it's up to them. But um, just the fact that he's requesting to drink is, is a big deal for him. Hey, Jack, one more minute, okay? Okay. 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 He has an issue sometimes, like inflexibility a little bit, with just the trains in particular. When I'll ask him to come over to do a program real quick, he'll want to clean up the trains up every single time. With the other toys though, like I can call him over, he can take a break, he's totally fine, and then after we're done with our program, he'll go back and he'll play. With the trains in particular, I don't know why he wants to clean them up every single time. So I'll run some programs and we'll see if he has that <coughs> issue still. Hey, Jack. Good looking. Come here. Yeah, that's such good listening. Good job, mister. What is this? What are those? No, what are these? I like people. Uh-uh. What's this? What's this one?
Welcome back to Autism Live. That was the A word. As I said, this is an ongoing documentary. Um, we had the opportunity to be with Jack Riley's family yesterday. It should be noted that in the past, um, the filming that was done for the A word, Autism Live was not involved in until the, the most recent episode uh, that has been published, which was when we went to the zoo. And my son was there with Jack Riley, and that was two years ago. And uh, due to things happening and people moving places and going places, the, the filming had stopped for the last two years. And we had the opportunity to reconnect with the family yesterday and spent a, a great portion of yesterday filming with the family. And I just want to say again, what an amazing family this is. Uh, how willing and open they have been to let people come in and learn from their experience. It was such an honor to get to spend time with them ever, uh, but certainly yesterday and to see how far Jack Riley has come. It's so inspirational. We can't wait to be able to share with you the video that we had yesterday, but this little boy is an amazing young man and he's doing amazing things and I was just watching in that video when they were working on eye contact because you know one of the first things I noticed and said is that this young man's eye contact uh, my mama's heart is just you know green with envy in the best possible way because he has some fabulous eye contact it's so there and present and natural and not uh, in any way avoiding and not in any way too much. It's just the bomb. It's, <laughs> he was just amazing. It was great to see his little sister, Lainey Grace, and how much she has grown. Uh, what a tremendous family. So we, we did do a bunch of footage with them that's going to be coming to you uh, as soon as we can get it edited. But just wanted to say another thank you to this amazing family. Um, for now, our, our, that was the last time that we would be filming uh, with this family for the foreseeable future. I won't say forever, but for the foreseeable future. Um, so the ongoing portion of it is ending as of yesterday, but you know we'll see because we don't know what the future holds. But truly an amazing family. I want to encourage you to watch The A Word and to continue to interact with the family on their Facebook page, The A Word. You know, one of the things when we were asking them yesterday about what has this experience been like for you, you've been such a gift to so many people, have you, has it meant anything to you doing The A Word? And they talked overwhelmingly about how amazing it is to hear from so many of you, how much that has meant to them, how much they've appreciated it, uh, how, and how what a gift that has been to them. So I want to encourage everybody to continue to interact with them on their Facebook page. Truly amazing, the A word. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back with some more autism news, so stick with us. It's every parent's desire for their child to have a great start in life. Yet there is a condition affecting more children's lives than pediatric cancer, diabetes, and AIDS combined. Autism strikes one in every 150 children. Today, one in 110 kids in the U.S. will be diagnosed with autism. That is a huge jump from 30 years ago when it was one in 30,000. Startling new report finds the number of children with autism is skyrocketing. The Centers for Disease Control estimates one in 68 children has a form of autism. Now that's a 30% increase in just two years. I think what kept me um, was the feeling that, you know, I, I would have a parent come to my um, office late at night at UCLA and just fall apart. And this is a long time ago, and there were much less back then oh, yeah. in terms of services and knowledge and so on. And I would just sit with the family and the parents and walk them through and try to take away some of their fears, you know. And at that point, I realized I think the thing that's actually most important to me is that process. Mm -hmm. I mean, thank God that I've been very, very lucky and blessed to have so many incredible clinicians join me along the way mm -hmm. and just 
develop cards in such an amazing, magnificent way um, that I could, you know, for me, it was more really about how can I help the families? Mm -hmm. What can I do for the moms, the dads? You know, mm -hmm. it, it is just, uh, and I feel like, you know, there's no way I would ever really know because I haven't had my own child go through this, mm -hmm. but I've experienced it with people mm -hmm. a, a lot of times. Yeah. Hi, this is Megan. I'm in first grade all by myself. My teachers are so fabulous. I like to read books. I like to go to my friends' birthday parties. I like to invite my friends to my birthday parties. I once had a sleepover with a friend. I like to have play dates with my friend. I'm the best reader in my class. I like to go to the library. I like to read different series of books. And here's how I learned to do all these things. By my card friends and Dr. Grant Pichet. Thank you, card friends and Dr. Grant Pichet. Welcome back to Autism Live. Uh, another uh, story in the news, two stories that I want to cover. I promised you there was a lot of news. Uh, this is particularly interesting to me. There's a place in Hastings uh, that is called the Sanctuary Retreat. And it's a, a holiday retreat for people with autism and Asperger symptoms. Um, so What's interesting about, I, I mean, I, that in and of itself is really amazing. It was established in the 1940s um, as a holiday business, and the young woman who is currently running it is herself on the autism spectrum, and this place was started by her grandparents, but it fell into decline following a fire, um, and then her grandfather had had a stroke. So recently she revived and reestablished the business at, with the particular interest and having it be a retreat for people who are on the autism spectrum. And part of what she is doing to help support the business, she's entered a contest, and the, um, the, I don't know if I have the, the woman's name, but the woman who is the, the head of the company has entered a contest that's being put on by Sir Richard Branson of Virgin, uh, Virgin Airlines and Virgin Mobile. Uh, the great, great business person who uh, has something that's called Pitch to Rich. Sounds a little like Shark Tank, like the British version of Shark Tank to me. Um, but it's a, a Dragon Den style competition. It's been whittled down uh, to a group of semifinalists that is only 150 businesses will have the ability to pitch their company to him and ask him to invest in their company. The, the winner of this can win 250,000 uh, pounds. And so, uh, She's, uh, they're going to go from 150 to 30 finalists, and um, Maggie Sullivan, that is her name, is going to be doing this pitch to see if the Sanctuary Retreat can get uh, some of that money. We have a quote here. Uh, she says, I believe those with learning difficulties and autism have a lot to offer the economy with their unique skills, perseverance, and their ability to think outside the box. The growth of our business will not only accelerate our ability to provide a much needed service to regular holiday makers and those with special needs in a rural area, but will also offer employment to others on the spectrum who have a great deal to offer local businesses. If we are successful, it would be a huge boost for the business and for those with autism. My hope is that it will inspire others with hidden disabilities to consider following their dream and consider becoming an entrepreneur. We've been talking a lot about entrepreneurship and employment, um, and here's just another fabulous example. Again, this is in Hastings. The name of the place is the Sanctuary Retreat, and it is run by Maggie Sullivan. Maggie, we wish you good luck. Sir Richard Branson, I hope that you see all that Maggie has to offer. We'll keep you guys posted whether she becomes a finalist and whether, in fact, she should win that 250,000 pound top prize. All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to be back with more after these messages.
Hi, I'm Shannon Penrod, and we're at the ABCs and XYZs of Special Needs Conference. And this year, for the first time, they've got something really remarkable. It's the Entrepreneurial Boutique. These are all items that have been made and are being sold by individuals who have special needs. So we're going to do a little shopping and talk to some of these fabulous entrepreneurs. Come on. My name is Molly Rarick and I'm founder of Breed's Gift. We're a nonprofit that serves teens and adults with special needs like Chase here. Uh, we were founded in 2013 and serve people in the Conejo Valley, Santa Barbara, and LA. Our main objective is to give our participants the skills they need to gain a more independent life. My name is Shelly Cox and um, Lisa Zalagi and I are founders of Creative Steps and Create Micro Business Enterprises. And the, the items that we're selling here today are all made by the clients who have uh, passions about what they want to make and then they get the profits from what they make after we've paid all of the other expenses. We are here today because um, I, my goal is to be independent and also I would like to share all my artwork and I would like to sell. Thinking about at his young age being a businessman, you know, it's, it's amazing. I cannot be more proud. Welcome back to Autism Live. I mentioned we had a lot of stories in the news and some of them were th thumbs up, um, some of them not so much thumbs up. This is one that's on, on the fence because there are some thumbs up and some that are, are were right here. You're gonna tell us whether you want it to be down or not. Uh, so in Indiana, there are a group of parents who have gotten together who have decided that they are going to make Anthem Blue Cross change their minds about what they're deciding to do about autism therapy. So first, they collected 10,000 signatures and then they rallied in the heart of Indianapolis. Uh, these parents gathered at Momentum Circle in downtown Indianapolis on Saturday to protest against Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield's insurance policy for children with autism. They called it limited, unfair and unjust. Apparently, recently, they had changed their policy. It says the amount of therapy per individual covered by the company was cut from 40 hours to 20 hours a week, putting some of the, some of the families in a financial pinch because, as you know, as we talk about here on the show, that um, for some of our kids, especially early on for early intensive behavioral intervention, studies have shown that we really want to be the the very smallest end uh, is 25 hours but where we're really seeing the most progress from that group of kids is between 30 and 40 hours a week 40 hours is considered the standard of giving them the best possible chance of getting to the progress that we know that they're capable of anything less than that we're not giving them the full prescription so very interesting that for a period of time in Indiana that Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield was offering 40 hours a week therapy. It is disheartening to me. It is hard for me to accept that already at this point in the game that they can possibly be saying that they have studies showing that it's just as effective at 20 hours a week. So I personally want to stand with these parents who stood in the rain on Saturday. I want to stand with them and give them a big thumbs up because you are fighting the good fight. Make them show you. You have studies that show how effective it is at 40 hours. You have studies that show you that it can be almost as effective at 35 hours. But I want to know what studies are Blue Cross Blue Shield, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield in Indiana seeing that show them that 20 hours can be as effective. Are they now going to go and cut the penicillin prescription to thousands of children and say we're just going to see if it's as effective as the full dose of pen penicillin? This 
this is the good fight that you folks are fighting and I join with you. If there's something that I can do to help you, let me know because this is not right. Uh, we are going to see more of this from insurance companies because if they can get away with it, why wouldn't they do it? But the truth of the matter is, is that they're only hurting themselves. The reason why they cover things is because it's effective and if they give you a dose that's not as effective then all they're doing is wasting their time your time and we're gonna lose the progress that we could get to with those kids so again I stand with you Anthem, pay attention. Where are the studies that show that that's what's effective? You're going to end up having to pay for this anyway because we're not letting you get away with this. Uh, and that's how I see things, right? <laughs> uh, in any case, congratulations to those families in Indianapolis. Let's all stand together with them. Anthem, pay attention. We're going to be right back after these messages. What would you do if your child was hurting? If your family's future was uncertain. If help seemed out of reach. Have you been given no hope? Taga means I am not alone in this. This is the reality for families affected by autism. And today, the number of children with autism is growing more rapidly than ever. Taka unites these families and shows that they do not have to fight this battle alone. Our oldest son, Jared, who has autism, um, when we first um, took him to the doctor to get the diagnosis, you know, it, it's so sad because they offer you nothing. There's no help, there's no hope. One of the things that you learn with autism is being very grateful for even the small milestones. You know, when you first get the diagnosis, there's, you go through all the range of emotions. You know, this can't be happening. Why is this happening? You have to get to a point where it's the emotion that has to be leading is, what can I do? The first thing that struck me was walking to a room and seeing, oh my gosh, we're not alone. And there is this very strong community that's already set. And something I still today associate with Taka the most is hope. To me, that's what Taka means. Taka means hope. like you've got all these dreams and goals of what your son's going to do and you get your diagnosis and you're sent home and that's it there's no plan of action there's no here's autism here's what we're going to do to make your life better and help him it's strictly go home and try to process it and go on the internet it was devastating and you just you know you go through this three week of depression and then you snap out of it you have to and then you start making phone calls and trying to figure out what is autism and what are we going to do and then we found Taka, and it was life-changing. Autism, there really is no definitive answer. It is trying to find the, the resources that are out there that can assist you to help your child so that you, know, you just don't feel so helpless at those particular moments. There was direction, and there was hope, and there was a little ray of sunshine that he's going to be OK, and we're going to be OK. I always look back and think we would never be where we are. Carson wouldn't be where he is at without Taka. So 13 years ago, my son was diagnosed with autism, and that put our whole family into a tailspin. There were so many different ideas and things that were not proven. Nobody knew what, to, what guidance to give us. We had no direction. And then we found Taka. They helped give us a path to follow, help give our son a better future and make him healthy and put him back onto the, to the road of recovery. When your son's first diagnosed, the first thing you hope for is, gosh, I just want my son to speak. I just want to be able to communicate with him in some way. Then you want a little more. You want him to go to a regular school. Then you want him to potentially have a real life and go to college. So you're always hoping for f the future of your child. My son is a happy, healthy, vibrant young boy that's gonna turn 15 really soon. And we couldn't be more pleased and without Taka, I don't think we'd be in the place that we are today. We believe the future is not defined for many affected by autism. There is hope and direction for these kids and their families. Taka is dedicated to providing community, support, education, and hope to families affected by autism. At Taka? At Taka, 
at TACA. We are families with autism helping. Helping. Helping, helping families. Helping families with autism. Hi, my name is Matt. I am 19 years old and I was diagnosed with autism when I was six years old. Autism is one of the fastest growing developmental disabilities in the United States, but I am living proof that with the right treatment, hope is possible. My future is not limited. Today, I am attending Fullerton Community College and I run for the cross country team for fun with my friends. It makes me feel proud when I think about my progress. Chances are you know someone affected by autism. Show them they are not alone and help others get on the road to recovery. Contribute to talk about curing autism today. Welcome back to Autism Live. Wanted to address some of the things that you guys have written in um, over the last weekend. Somebody wrote in and said, Dear Shannon, uh, do you still use skills? How often do you change the program and answer the surveys? Do you review the programs as needed? And thank you. Um, I do still use skills. And you know, uh, you remind me that I have a, an event coming up on June 9th in Orange County that I'm going to be speaking at an event for parents um, specifically about how can a parent utilize skills. And, and I think there are lots of different ways to utilize skills and I always talk about the fact that schools is, skills is one of those amazing, um, you know when you go to the hardware store and towards the front of the hardware store they have those amazing tools that uh, you know, it's one screwdriver, but it can do 48 different things. It's like the, the Swiss army knife of screwdrivers. Um, and I own like two or three of those screwdrivers. And most of the time, I only ever use it for uh, being one thing, for being a Phillips head screwdriver, right? <laughs> and I only use one, it has a bunch of different bits that can go into it. And I use it for one thing mostly. But the reason why I have that screwdriver is because every once in a while, every once in a blue moon, I need one of the other things and I don't want to go to the hardware store to get it. I want to have it there at my fingertips to be able to have that little teeny tiny thing that you need to unscrew the back of a certain Fisher Price toy or the back of, you know, whatever it is now. Um, so those tools are really great to have, but you don't necessarily use everything that the tool comes with and you certainly don't use it on a regular basis. For me, that's skills. Um, you know, yesterday when we were at uh, Jack Riley's and interacting with the family and, and there were two different therapists that came while we were there and uh, the first one they were outside and they were playing basketball and it was so interesting to me because Jack Riley's older now and he was playing basketball and his therapist was there and they're hanging out and they're being guys and they're playing basketball. But the therapist, it was a perfect example of how therapy works with kids who are older because the therapist, you know, he was praising him and saying, oh, you know, basketball and they're doing all these different things. And then he was sneaking therapy in on the side. Uh, and asking him different things. And sometimes he would just, you know, at one point they were talking about, oh, we're taking the ball and we're going to kiss it off of the, the backboard. And, and Jack Riley thought that was funny. And the therapist was talking about it and saying, you know, what do you think that means to kiss it off of the back of the blackboard? Because he was working on um, speech that is more, you know, um, using idioms. And what does it actually, is it actually kissing the blackboard? But he was doing it in a very natural environment training session. And then a little bit later on, you know, they're playing basketball and they're doing things. And at one point the, the therapist said to him, uh, he goes, hey, you know, Jack Riley, I went to the store yesterday and I, uh, I, I was shopping for groceries and I bought some groceries and then I came home. And Jack Riley was like, oh, okay, cool. And he goes, so what do you think the most important part of that story is? And, uh, and I was standing there with dad and, and all of a sudden I started to break out into sweat. I was like, oh my gosh, what is the most important part of that story? Um, but that lesson is a lesson in saliency. When somebody gives you a bunch of facts, what's the most important part of it? And I was standing there and I was thinking, oh, 
man, I have not been working on that with Jem. And, you know, at different points, you need to cycle back. You know, there was a time when Jem, uh, he totally mastered saliency, but I need to cycle back and I need to put some saliency lessons in. And it made me think about the fact that I've been using skills in a particular way and haven't been focusing on some things. And on the way home last night, I was, I, we had some time in the car and I was talking to Jem about some stuff and I thought, okay, I'm going to go back into my EF curriculum and put some things in for GEM. Um, but it's really within that very natural environment training that I just read the lesson and say to myself, okay, uh, you know, what, what is it that, uh, that I want to focus on here, like saliency, and then put it into his just, I might be in the car with him, we'll be on the way to school, and if I was going to work on saliency, I would say to him, oh, you know, I was talking to Kelby today, and Kelby told me this whole big long thing, and I would tell him the whole big story, and then at the end I would say, what do you think the most important thing, if we were going to tell Daddy about this, what, would we tell him the whole big long story, or what would be the most important thing for Dad to know about this? And there's my lesson, right? And I will continue working on it until, and I will set myself some sort of mastery criteria and say, you know, I, this is the point at which I think he's got it. So I am going to put some of those lessons back in, but I will tell you how I do use skills on a regular basis. I lean into it at different times of the year for different things. I only go back in to answer your question and answer questions um, two different times um right and mostly it's right around his birthday um because sometimes a lesson gets added in although he's turning 12 so i don't this year i don't think i get any more lessons added in but i might because of the advanced uh, cognition curriculum i might get some lessons added in but i've answered all the questions so the only time i have more questions to answer are on his birthday and there are specific times that I go in if there's something that we need to tweak in the IEP or something isn't happening at school. It's when I see a hole in what he's got going on that I think, oh, you know, there's, you know, there's a, a thing that he's missing. And sometimes saliency is a part of it, right? Uh, I've noticed lately that um, being able to paraphrase um, that he mostly has, but occasionally it's a little bit tougher. So, uh, and the, easy to do the paraphrasing thing uh, like saliency um, there's just a slight difference between the two of them because saliency is what's the most important thing and the paraphrasing is being able to say you know what was the whole thing that got said I love watching the news with my son and then have him tell me afterwards uh, you know what were the things that uh, that got said on the news um, because a lot of times there are little nuancey things that you miss out on. You can even do it with uh, regular television. It doesn't have to be the news. We love to watch the Goldbergs. He finds it hilariously funny, and it gives me an opportunity to talk about the 80s, uh, which for me is a, a great, great opportunity. I <laughs> loved. Can we go back to the 80s? Can we please, please go back to the 80s? I want to have big shoulder pads, um, and let's definitely go back to the music in the 80s. Uh, so, and it gets, you know, great opportunity for me to talk about my childhood with my child. Um, so that's how I use skills, um, but I'm going to be a little bit more in the lesson portion of it than I'd been recently because it just reminded me how many good, good things there are in skills, watching them working with Jack Riley yesterday and how easy it is to be working in a, in a natural environment. It doesn't have to at all be that DTT. Uh, just gave me another... Uh, jolt of that and especially for those of you who have kids who are older that executive functions curriculum and that cognition curriculum and the social skills curriculum oof, those are awesome awesome curriculums to be using all right we're gonna take a break and then we're gonna be back with more of your questions after these messages Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior, and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The Skills Assessment and Curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes Skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. 
Skills is a four-step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions, or simply type in a keyword find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step 3. Choose activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step 4. Start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The Skills Language Curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're continuing to answer some of the questions that you guys have written in on our live feature. Somebody said, I noticed there wasn't any listing yet for Denver or Colorado Springs. Was I using the wrong tool or is there just nothing there yet? What's the outreach to the, uh, like to those businesses and how can I help? Uh, great question. Um, when you go to the Center for Autism uh, website, which is centerforautism.com, there's a locations tab. And when you click on the locations tab, it lists all of the offices that are currently open. Some t and there's a bunch of offices that are getting ready to open, and sometimes um, until they're, they've had their open house, they're not listed there. When the Denver one is listed, and I, I could be wrong, but I think that it, it is up this week, um, their website, it will be listed under Aurora. So I know that makes it really hard. Um, but uh, for those of you who are in the Denver area, you know that Aurora is a suburb of Denver. And since that's where the actual location is, um, that's, that, it will be under that office, Aurora. Um, I don't know what they're going to be calling the Colorado Springs office, and I don't think that it is yet listed there. Um, but I had specifically asked as a parent that they put the listings. They, they used to be under alphabetical order, which was I felt not helpful to anyone. So now they are under state so that you find your state first, and then it lists um, the different locations so that hopefully that will help you in your search. Um, and, but the, the outreach for all of the different offices that are card related is the same, and that is to go to the 800 number. Um, so I encourage you when you go, definitely check to see if there is an office near you. Um, but everybody starts with the same path because everybody has to go through the same process uh, to begin to be a card client. So you start with the 800 number and they're an amazing group of people um, that they, they get a lot of phone calls. 
um, and they don't have an easy job at all, but they are an amazing group of people. They help connect you to all of the different paperwork that you need to get to be a client because each one of you has a different insurance situation. Each one of you has different needs, so there is no one-size-fits-all, and they help connect you to the, the contracts department who then makes sure that they get your insurance all together. They do the legwork for you. Um, they will give you assignments of things that you need to do. For instance, one of the things that all new card clients have to do is to get their skills account um, working so that they can take the entire assessment. It is now required of you to have the full assessment completed before you can be um, put into services. And then there's parent training. I mean, there's things that you need to do to get you ready, and they're designed to get you ready. We didn't have all those things when I was starting with CARD. You had to go to an outside provider and do 16 hours of, uh, of therapy that, while it was useful to me, I would have rather have had the, the training from CARD so that it would have been better prepared. It's still, it, the, the the process is actually streamlined um, from before that it takes longer. I think it took us five months before we were able to start actually get services with CARD. Um, and they can do it in a lot less time than that now, but it still takes a while. And when they do start now, they're ready to start. Whereas before, you know, then we had to fill out the paperwork, oy, right? And they had to get to know my child. When you do the skills assessment, they're gonna, they're gonna start you in a better way. So do call the 800 number. If you are in a place where it's an office that's just starting, um, or you're a place where the office hasn't started yet and you would really like to be on the list to get an office, uh, John Galley is the person at CARD who um, is in charge of that, and you can speak to him or to Dorothy who works with him. You can send him an email at j.galley, spelled G-A-L-L-E, dot uh, centerforautism.com, not dot, at j.galley at centerforautism.com um, because each office that gets started it has the same exact path there are a group of parents who uh, say we want an office and again it's a group of parents who begins working together and most of the time they start with workshop that they have individuals coming to their community and they gather more parents because they see oh my gosh your child is making so much progress what is it that you're doing and they grow and grow and grow until it's a natural evolution that an office is ready because the clients are already there so that is the way that you can be helpful to help make those offices become a reality I know that those of you who I can remember two years ago when um, people were writing in and saying, when is there ever going to be an office that's happening in Portland? And it's happening. It's happening like this month happening because parents kept saying, we want these services. Uh, they started workshops and it's, and it's happening. I've seen it happen even faster too, but it, it, like it's a group of parents that bring it. That's really that's really what happens. Also wanted to address uh, another person uh, had a question. Dear Shannon, does the CARD Adult Services have services for individuals who are low functioning? For example, have no language communication, need assistance for toileting, etc. Can they provide supervision and programming? And thank you for setting up these forward thinking services. And please know that you know. Uh, CARD is doing that, not I. I, I just uh, have them on to report about it, but yes, CARD does. They absolutely can make a huge difference for individuals who are adults who have not had services before or had services and you know and need more services for those individuals who are on the spectrum who are profoundly affected for those of you who have, a, have adults um, that are in your family that still need toileting help absolutely card has demonstrated over 30 years how effective they can be how much progress that they can get to for that population as well as the young kids right we never want to leave out those adults and especially those that are profoundly affected card has programs for them and can be incredibly useful you talk about a gift to a family 
uh, an amazing thing. And they can also provide long distance supervision uh, and programming as well for anywhere in the world. They have those workshop services. So definitely check that out if you need that. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about what I promised at the start of the show, FAPE, free appropriate public education, adding into that in the least restrictive environment. And this year's add-in is giving the individual a floor of opportunity from which to access the curriculum. Oh, those are some big words, and occasionally there's some fighting words. So stick with us. We're going to give you the 411 on that right after these messages. There's been another new study about optimal outcomes, and I wanted to know what are your thoughts on recovery? Do you think it's possible? Do you believe in recovery from autism? On recovery, you learn how to adapt. I mean, I've had a lot of experimental brain scans done, and they have found things that are definitely abnormal. I have an enlarged left ventricle that's definitely abnormal. That's not going to go away. That scan was done less than five years ago. But you work with someone and they adapt. Uh, you're not going to make me an algebra specialist. Uh, that's just not going to happen. But things like learn, getting better at public speaking, that is something that I gradually learned. What I'm seeing today, especially with some of the kids on the mild end of the spectrum, I'm seeing teenagers that are much milder than me that haven't learned things like how to go up to the counter at McDonald's and order food all by themselves, how to go on the bus, uh, how to shop, how to go in the store and shop, how to do a checkbook, basic things like that. Because what drives me crazy is when I go back to the cattle world and I see a guy in the maintenance shop that's running the whole maintenance shop at a big plant and he's as Asperger as he can be and he's running the whole maintenance shop. And then I see Junior that's addicted to video games and you can't get his duff off his chair and, and get him doing things. Now when I was in high school, I did a lot of thinking about this. Um, I got kicked out of a large girls school for throwing a book and I went to a special boarding school up on a farm and I was allowed to work with the farm animals. And they let me goof off and not study. But I got to thinking, there's one thing they did not let me do. I goofed off and I didn't study, but I had to physically go to class. When I didn't want to go to the Friday night movie, they made me the projectionist. One thing they were not going to let me do is sit in my room, become a recluse in my room. They were not going to allow that. I want to know why you threw the book. Who'd you, why did you throw it? Oh, I threw a throw book it? at a girl because she called me a retard. Oh, good reason. Oh, no, to throw she it teased out. me. And I had some problems getting in fights when kids teased me. But it was always brought about by someone picking on me. And the principal had me kicked out of school, out of a large girl's school for doing that. And what'd your mom say? Well, uh, she was not very happy about the whole thing because when the principal called, I answered the phone and he said I was incorrigible and I was kicked out of school. Mm -hmm. Mother was really angry that he just said that right directly to me, yeah. which was definitely not very appropriate. Welcome back to Autism Live. All right, the star of the show, we talked about FAPE, our jargon for today, free appropriate public education. I promised a little discussion. You know, every year we like to sort of add to the pile. So if you're coming in a little bit late, go back and watch some of our previous shows. But free appropriate public education here in the United States, it's what everyone is offered. There's some more language to it, though. It's not just free appropriate public education. It's free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. And last year, we really focused on getting that added to our vocabulary vocabulary because what that means is that um, they can't just stick all of our kids in one classroom all by themselves and say you know they have autism so that's where they're supposed to go because the law states right there in black and white free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment now this all of these things can work for us and they can work against us as individuals who have children who are on the autism spectrum and by the way these can work for and against teachers and these can work for and against administrators at schools um, as a parent and as a former teacher I'm more interested in how do we get our kids best educated how can we use these these bits of language to get our kids the best possible education that legally they have the, the right to so how do we use least restrictive environment? We already talked about with appropriate. We want to drill home. It has to be appropriate. How is it appropriate? And whenever I say appropriate, I mean effective. Because if it's not effective, how can they possibly argue that it's appropriate? This whole antiquated notion of that we're going to park kids in a room and have them fill out worksheets that have nothing to do with what anybody else is doing in the classroom is beyond horrible. 
Um, it, it is a disservice to our educators. It's a disservice to our individuals who are on the autism spectrum or who have other challenges. We know that they're capable of ever so much more than that. So we want to do something that's appropriate, that's effective, right? And in the least restrictive environment. So if um, we're, we have an argument that um, they want to put a, an individual in a special day class. That is a more restrictive environment than general education. Now, I want to be clear that not all kids can benefit from a general education setting. I am very aware of that. For the longest time, I have argued and said, no, inclusion, 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 inclusion for all. And I do believe that we need to get to inclusion for all, but I do see that there are places where they don't have the training to do inclusion and do it right. But if you can get good inclusion, I can make a case that all of our kids all of our kids, whether they're on the spectrum or not, benefit from inclusion. We've seen it work when we have the best of all possible things working. But remember, we don't always get what's best, we get what's appropriate, right? Um, although I can make the case that it's appropriate for all of our kids, right? But in, in certain circumstances, there are lots of parents that are going to choose a more restrictive environment because of their individual kids' needs. And that is important to me. For the, an individual kid, what is the best possible setting? And you guys know that if you call me and we have an opportunity to talk because there's something that you, you, need, you need some help and support somebody in your corner and you just want to talk it through with somebody, and there are many of you that I've had the opportunity to do that with, one of the first things I ask you is, what is it that your gut is saying? What do you feel is right? What do you think it, your child needs? Because it's amazing to me what the mom or dad will come out with in that moment. And I think almost always it's spot on that that's exactly what the kid needs. It's just a question of who has that program, right? And sometimes you own a home and the program for the place where you own the home that is the only thing that you can afford is not what you exactly needed, right? And that's crushing. But uh, super important that we think it through and think what is the least restrictive environment for this individual. Because if if it's that the person needs to be in a setting completely by themselves, and there are kids who have such sensory issues that that's where they need to be. If that's where they're going to actually learn, then let's give that to them. There are some kids that need to be with five other kids um, so that they have the social input from that. And there are some kids that, that really can benefit from the general education setting. But the least restrictive environment is what that child is entitled to. That's that's what the law says, free appropriate public, edu public education in the least restrictive environment. But then the new piece that we're adding, that's always been a part of it, but we want to raise our consciousness to this, um, that it states that it must be where the child has a floor of opportunity in which to access the curriculum. Okay, so what does that mean? That means for the schools, it's an out that the child doesn't have to make progress. Uh, in some cases, that the child doesn't have to excel, they just have to be given a floor of opportunity in which to access the curriculum. So schools are more and more using this phrase to say, well, we gave them the floor of opportunity, but your child just wasn't able to overcome challenge, 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 so therefore we're going to put you in a more restrictive environment. Um, or we're just giving up on your child in terms of if we've already given you a more restrictive environment, we gave them the floor of opportunity, your child didn't meet their goals, we throw up our hands because we gave the floor of opportunity. I think what's important for us to know as educators and as parents how to argue for a better floor of opportunity and be mindful that when we are seeing what is a crappy excuse for a floor of opportunity that we call them on it. That we make sure that they have provided training for the teacher who is doing the floor of opportunity because you can't say we gave them a floor of opportunity and give them somebody who has not been trained in whatever the technique is that they have decided and it is important to note that we do not get to dictate to the schools which philosophies they use for teaching, which trainings they use for training training for the individuals who are going to be implementing the philosophy, right? But what we do have the right to do is ask them, what studies do you have that show that your philosophy is effective? And what training have you given in that philosophy?
because if they can't give us those papers to show that we do show that this is effective um, and this is what we're using to do this and I guarantee you most schools don't have this because they can't afford to do research and yeah do I feel a little bit bad about putting them under that pressure mm, not really because you need to get the job done our kids are all valuable there is a way to educate all of our kids and you gotta be up to the job you can't just be about stamping the cards and saying oh we showed up and we didn't get the job done but we gave the floor of opportunity so argue use it against them use the floor of opportunity back in their face and say how are you providing a floor of opportunity for my child to access the curriculum in the least restrictive environment in an appropriate setting and then and then let them dig their own grave <laughs> because that's a lot of language to throw back at them that will show them that you know what you're talking about and by the way that's a question you need to have answered right they got to come back with something that's reasonable make sure you have a tape recorder running when they answer that question because there are a lot of people who don't know that they'll put out their FAPE and say, here is the FAPE that we're offering you. And when you ask, how is it that this is providing a floor of opportunity uh, in the least restrictive environment that is appropriate for my individual child? Oh, you got to know what you're talking about to be able to come back and say, this is why and here's the research that we have. I don't think you're going to find that in most school settings. Then they're going to know they're dealing with somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, and by the way, then what happens is that they start looking at your child as an individual and start saying how are we going to educate this child it forces them to think of it that way and unfortunately at a lot of schools that's what you're going to have to do in order to get them to think that way because meanwhile they've got the conveyor belt well you know here's here's the autism room that we have okay all right but what's happening in the autism room is it something that's useful? Is it something that's appropriate? And is it appropriate for every single one of the kids in the room? Um, you know, and, and what opportunity do those cat, kids have to interact with other kids? And it's not just for our kids' sake. When you see true, fabulous inclusion, you see how it changes the other kids too and how they are better students, how they are more tolerant and they're better people going out into the world. Um, I, don't even get me started about inclusion. It's important on so many levels. It is so important that we do not allow them to uh, put our kids someplace else and s put them all in a room together and say, and now we can educate you. Really? Really. Um, again, don't get me started. Okay, I gotta talk to you, for, I got two minutes here uh, that I wanna tell you really quickly that tomorrow night, Temple Grandin and Friends it's the event of a lifetime. Kelby and I are going to be there. We're going to be videotaping behind the scenes uh, to later on unveil a project. Uh, so important. Remember, this whole project is about Autism Works Now, about helping to raise money, raise awareness, raise consciousness so that people help individuals get jobs when they are on the autism spectrum but the lineup is amazing joe montagna is our, our host of the entire event temple granin is speaking danny bowman is speaking two people that are getting awards ed asner and uh and the fab <laughs> A uh, fabulous array of Stephen Shore, uh, both Asners are, are going to be, uh, Matt Asner is going to be getting an award too. You're going to see Joanne Loras, uh, just uh, uh, James Durbin is performing. Go to templegrandinandfriends.com, get your tickets if you're in the area. Tune in with us tomorrow. We, we have uh, Dr. Doreen Grandpache. She's going to be answering your questions. All of that is tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me. We're totally out of time. Bye-bye for now.